Hi, I'm Sam. And I'm Max. And this is Movies Actually, where we give you an honest review of the movies we've meddled with so mischievously over at Maybe Movies. And this time, we're talking about They Live. The 1988 John Carpenter-directed film starring Rowdy Roddy Piper, Keith David, Meg Foster, and featuring John Carpenter alumni Peter Jason, and of course... Back flower. Blow it out your ass. Yes. Oh my god. Uh, where, where, where do we begin? All right. Well, let's start with our basics. Where were you when you began? Okay. So this one is. This was one of the last classic Carpenter films that I saw. Mm. Uh, honestly, I, I can't give you an exact date. I'm reasonably sure I didn't see it. Till I moved back to Norwich, so that's post-2006. Oh, wow, that late. Yes. That, I was late to the game myself. I remember the trailers immensely, but I never actually hired it. It was one I was always going to watch but never got round to. I don't think I watched it until, I want to say, 95 or 96. No, this one, I mean, definitely it was my friend Rob, I know that, um, who had several times and said, oh, have you seen They Live? Didn't give anything away, just said, check it out, it's really good. And then I picked it up somewhere, and I was like, oh, I've heard it's really good. And then I watched it. Oh, yes. And then I was like, is, how is, is this my new favourite John Carpenter? <laughs> For me, it was because by that age, I was reasonably sophisticated in my philosophy about things. Mm-hmm. And it was like having had someone read my mind. Uh, the only feeling I've had this stronger about was The Matrix. mm which, in some respects, it's almost like um, the Matrix for the analog age. You know what? That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. It really does, folks. Yeah, think of it that way. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a film that doesn't put a beat wrong, really. Mm, it, it's amazing because it's full of um, Carpenter's idiosyncrasies that create a slightly alienated environment, but everything at the same time somehow feels real and familiar. Yes, it does very much feed into that thing that Carpenter has about taking uh, ostensibly ordinary people and putting them in very extraordinary situations. Absolutely, yes. I mean, obviously the perfect example is this, the thing, obviously. Um, and I mean, that's the other thing about about this film, before we go sort of say anything more about it. I'm sure, I know we've discussed it before, just you know, in conversations, and I've had the same conversation with so many people. Mm. We, we live in an age of, of, of sequels and remakes. Oh God, so many, so and many. Everything tries to cash in on films that are from, from our... No, from uh, within our recorded memory, if you like. Oh, Gen Z, late boomer. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Gen Z, Gen, Gen X. X. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, folks. Gen X, we are Gen X, not Gen Z. Whereas Carpenter had the right idea from the start. Go back to the source. Go back to the ideas, th- things that were coming out in the fifties and sixties, things that could use a modern interpretation. Absolutely. You know. I mean, that was very much one of his things. I don't know if you're aware of this, folks, but if you go back to the original Halloween, uh, one of the films that the children are watching on Halloween night before they carve their pumpkins is the original thing from Another World. Yep, 1951, Howard Hughes. And I did notice this evening, watching back, there is an old black and white sci-fi movie going on in the background, but I couldn't quite pick out which one no, it was. No, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. I'd have to up that one up. They Live Itself is based on... Uh, so there was originally, uh, in 1963, um, a short story called Eight O'Clock in the Morning, mm. which is uh, literally about two, two and a half sides of A4, if you just print it out. It's not a very long story at all, which was written by Ray Nelson. And then in the early 80s, it was turned into a into a comic book uh, yes. and called They Live. And it was the comic I thought book. it was called Nada. I thought it was called They Live. Oh, uh, right. Uh, if anybody knows for sure, correct us, please. And it's the comic book version that this is 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 based on. But obviously, taking a lot of ideas from from the original story. Interestingly enough, the story itself was written in 1963, uh-huh. and Ray Nelson apparently was a friend and a occasional uh, collaborator of Philip K. Dick. Oh, and it's interesting because of how the story differs. What happens to the character in that, whose name is George Nada? He goes to uh, see a stage hypnotist. That's right, yes. I remember, I've read the story just yeah. the once. Just yes. the once. And the hypnotist, at the end of his act, wakes up the audience, 
but George wakes up entirely. Yes. What I found interesting is recently, for the first time, I watched... Um, You're not going to say Stir of Echoes, are you? I am going to say Stir of Echoes. You are going to say Stir... No, I, I have seen the correlations, the original story to Stir of Echoes. Which was written based on a story by Richard Matheson. Exactly. I was going to <laughs> so say, it's, like, it's, Yeah. You know, all of those guys, obviously. Um, and it, it's fantastic. It, it, it works so well. What I th- thought was um, interesting as well... When you've read when you've read the original story, mm. they basically ripped off the original story in Doctor Who under Stephen Moffat with the silence. No. A, the aliens that when you look away, you forget about them. Oh yeah, yeah. How Matt Smith's Doctor, of course, out, how yes. he outwits them is basically the ending of the, of eight o'clock in the morning. I'm going to have to go back and watch those episodes to see how I can see he, it. He basically tricks them into outing themselves. Okay. Okay. And that's exactly what okay. happens in the, in the short story. But obviously, the graphic novel is slightly different. I know they did take certain panels from the um, from the graphic novel version and try and put them into the film. Oh, okay. So, uh, like like the last shot of the film with the, with the lady in bed? Yeah. That's a pan- basically a panel from the comic. Hey, what's wrong, baby? Oh, right. Okay, I haven't seen the comic. I've only read the original short story. It's all in the special features. On, uh, if you have a look on the DVD or on the Blu-ray. All right. Which is interesting because in the actual film it says it was based on the short story and doesn't mention the comic book at all. No, no, I'm surprised about that. Yeah. So. Mm, yes, we got very distracted <laughs> here, but that's because there's so much to talk about with this movie. There is. So, quick summary of the plot. Mm. Um, Rowdy Roddy Piper plays Nada. I think sometimes they refer to him as John Nada, but. Yeah, just Nada. Just Nada. Who is. Part of a class of what generally referred to as working class homeless or working homeless, mm-hmm. which yeah. is the thing that used to exist here in the UK. I think it kind yeah. of originated here. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Right. You used to get it quite a lot. People, yeah, they would be technically homeless. They would travel to where the work was. I, mean, I know it's an old tradition in America, at least 150 years old. Yeah, no, there certainly was a thing here. It was one of the. Uh, it was something it was that, seasonal work. You'd follow the seasonal work. It was something it? that grew out of the Industrial Revolution. Ah, the workers moved oh, over right. there, so but my family are here. I can't afford to uproot them, so I'll I'll go and work and yeah, exactly. send money yeah. back home. That's essentially what Nada is, and he arrives in LA looking for work, and while he's here, becomes embroiled with uh, a conspiracy or becomes aware of a conspiracy by creatures from another world to keep us in our place. Yes, and the more he learns, or the further he goes down the rabbit hole the less he can return to normality. That's abs... No, that is exactly it, yes. Have a gold star. Oh, thank you. I'll make sure. Remind me. Remind <laughs> me in August. No, that's a, <laughs> that's a really nice, neat summation. If we told you more, we'd be giving too much of the movie away. You should be watching this yourself. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You absolutely. should be watching this yourself. Yeah, I mean, so much has been said about this film. It appears in so many different things. They reference it so much. Obviously, at the time when it came out, they he was... Railing against the um, post Reaganism, yes, the plurocratic um, form of government that's yeah. government by the wealthy. Yeah, it was it was it was all about capitalism. It was all about the big market. But it's fascinating how much it's equally relevant today when you look at the rise of stakeholder capitalism. The include of this the, the way they kind of insinuate things like DEI and ESG into everything. This like this concept of heightening um, diversity which only ever results in making everybody the same. Yes. And that kind of globalism, it's just as applicable to that. This is one of the things. The the, the more I watched this movie, even though I was a huge Carpenter fan, I don't know why I delayed, but I did delay watching this movie for quite a while. And when I finally watched it, it was like, for me, it was like a sequel to 1984. Mm. You know, it was what happens after the revolution. And it's totally changed my view of the world well no it didn't change my view of the world it reinforced it it really reinforced the the realization that large portions of our life are entirely fake Mm -hmm. entirely manufactured simply to extract money from us well it's like that that line it says in the film (laughs) it figures it would be something like this yeah and the thing is I watched that so I watched that when I was I don't know what 22 23 the first time even though I should have watched it when I was 15 when it came out. But it 
resonates and it continues to resonate. And every time I watch it, the more I realise how much more true the world of that film is now than it ever has been before. Yeah, it's certainly one of the guys they talked to on one of the special features. He says, it's one of those films that you kind of feel unfortunate that it hasn't dated. But the no, message, it's wrong. That the it should be it should be an old, oh, look, this is how we used to be. Yes. But it's not. No, we're ever more like that. Ever more and ever more and ever more. Ever more, ever more, ever more, ever more. Well, I thought it was fascinating. Again, it's perfect because so Sandy King, who's the producer on this, mm. who's now Sandy King Carpenter, Oh, is she? Yes. Yes, yes. It's Mrs. Oh, right. Um, They had a pre-production meeting with Universal, Mm. and they only had two things that they weren't overly happy about. First off, they weren't happy about the casting of Rowdy Roddy Piper. I think they wanted somebody with a bit more star appeal. Yes, because Rowdy Roddy Piper was one of the first wrestlers to make the jump. Yes. To really make the jump into Hollywood. Which was because Carpenter's a big wrestler fan. In the the post-rock days, we take this for granted, but back then it was a big deal. Yeah. The other one was they wanted to make the ghouls uh, cannibals, which is something that is in the original story. Yeah, yeah. But they said they wanted to make the the, um, the ghouls cannibals to increase the level of threat, to which Sandy King replied, what, do you not see the loss of your humanity as a threat? And the exec from Universal replied, where's the threat? We all sell out every day. And they give that line to Buck Flower. What's the threat? We all sell out every day. In the yes! Film. It's from that meeting. They t- literally took what the exec told them and put it in the movie. <laughs> you literally couldn't make it up, folks. You literally couldn't. In terms of Carpenter's films, when it came out, it's one of the ones that did better than a lot of his films. It hit number one in its first week and stayed at number one in the US for two weeks. Well, it was so topical. Yes. It was so topical. Yeah, and so it wasn't a weirdo horror or about some obscure subject like Lovecraft or something. It was everybody. It's about TV and magazines and... Yeah, of course. So it was a success. They made it for about $4 million and took about 13.4 million. Yeah, yeah, that'll do. So that'll that'll do. do. That'll be a win. Yeah. And it was a joy. Again, if we were trying so hard to find an excuse to do it on, on maybe movies. So we did this as our, our double bill with... Big Trouble in Little China, or our mm. director double bill. Yes, yes. Which was fantastic. And it, 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 it's, it was quite fun, wasn't it? It was a good one. Yeah. It was a good one. If you want to check it out, check it out here. But yeah, it's one of those films that it will change your life. Again, anybody from... It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what age you grew up in. You will take something away from this. And it's, you know, it's... Again, I don't know if life-changing is a bit... Well, no, all right. Okay, here's the way I would put it. If you've read 1984, it will affect you in a similar way to 1984 it has done. If you've seen The Matrix, then you understand it will affect you in a similar way to The Matrix. It's in that milieu. It's it's trying to change your perspective. And if it can rock your world... I would have rocked your world. Absolutely. Even better. Definitely, definitely. Not surprisingly, again, this one gets all of the thumbs, more thumbs that we can pull out of our I don't actually have enough digits to give you all the (laughs) thumbs that are necessary for this film. It's awesome. Everybody should watch it once. Yes. It's um, it's one of those films about society that you should see. If you really want to um, put yourself through a ringer, uh, sit down, watch this, sit, and then watch, I don't know, Falling Down straight afterwards or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, but yeah, definitely. Really, really hammer it out. (laughs) Exactly, definitely, definitely check it out. Having said all of that, it, I've got to be really clear. This film is trying to tell you something, and you probably should listen to it. Not just like from a preachy point of view, but like this is someone trying to give you a very particular perspective on reality. And there is value to looking into this perspective. There is value into understanding, even if you yourself are middle class or higher class, just taking one brief moment out of your lives to look through the lens of someone else's life. That's one of the many, many things that this film is trying to encourage you to do, to recognize that people are not like you, Uh, whether you are literally working class, middle class, high class, nouveau riche, whatever the fuck, there is a perspective to be had here and a question 
a question that is being asked of you. And I'm going to ask you, are you brave enough to answer that question? If so, watch this film and have a good, good think about how you perceive the world around you. And your place in it and how you how you treat others as well. Absolutely. Fantastic. So, um, are, are you ready? Uh, ready for what? I, uh, I was told uh, uh, that he was born ready. We will see you next time. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs>